Hi, my name is Franca Alfin, and I'm the Director of Nutrition Services with Duke Student Health. And I'm Tony Apadula, and I'm one of the student health dietitians, and I also work with Duke Dining Services. So we're excited, I think, yes, yeah. to be here today, to be a part of certainly this uh, Healthy Duke initiative, the kickoff week. And um, yeah, I think we're going to have fun today and hopefully get everybody excited about some of the information that we're sharing. I think so. I think so. Today we want to talk to you about meal timing and why we think that's um, an important part of healthy eating and healthy living. Yeah, and uh, I'll probably play a devil's advocate here a little bit and say meal timing. We've got intermittent fasting and we've got paleo and eating clean. You know, why meal timing? Well, you know, meal timing is important because it's kind of the foundation of how we nourish ourselves and take care of ourselves during the day. And it's really the concept of eating consistently and regularly throughout the day um, for many benefits. And I know you know some. So. Yes, absolutely. I'd say, you know, part of it, I think, gets back to um, eating intuitively. Sometimes when we look outside of ourselves and we go on what are some of these more typical diets, it's what we're told to do. And it's about what to eat. And I think, right. as you and I are talking about, this is really about how we should be eating so that we're eating, listening more to our bodies in terms of what we need rather than being told by somebody else what we need to have. And the funny thing about this is, you know, meal timing has been around for a long time, but it seems to get overlooked a lot. So. Right. And I know you and I talk all the time about <laughs> whenever we're talking to someone in a session, this always comes up as almost the foundation of all the work we can do. Because before we can build up to, you know, in particular, the what we're eating, we really have to address the how of, we're eat, of, of our eating. Oh, absolutely. And again, I think I mentioned it, but it's so funny because when it does come up, people often say meal timing, that's so simple, or I've known that, but right. it's like the thing, the one thing that we've always overlooked, whereas we just fundamentally pull it back. It's amazing what we can get out of right. that. Right. All the results we can get. Yeah. You know, we can, we can fix overeating later in the day. Sometimes we can fix, you know, lack of energy during the day. We can sometimes fix food cravings. Yep. Um, so there's, there's a lot that we can gain from just sort of starting from the bottom and working our way up. Yeah, and one of the things I wanted to remember to do was to thank everybody who participated in the poll. I know that we sent out to some of you some questions just to give us some feedback in terms of what were your thoughts when we put out the term meal timing, what does everybody think about? So thank you so much for participating in that and hopefully we're gonna be addressing some of those points as we go through this conversation. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, so just to reiterate, uh, I know on the slide that you're seeing, we don't actually talk about what is meal timing. So maybe right. we just want to elaborate again on what do we actually mean by meal timing. Right. So meal timing means eating reliably and consistently throughout the day, not going long periods of time without eating, um, but you know, sort of establishing a pattern of eating consistently, feeding yourself consistently throughout the day that relates back to your signals of hunger and fullness. And I know we're gonna to touch more on those concepts of hunger and fullness in a little bit. But we are, as you know, they're real popular right now too. Yes, so we're hearing yes, all these terms, yes. so we certainly will. But I think one of the key things that, again, that you brought up, it's about how we eat, but meal timing is not eating by the clock. Right. So you know, how many times when you tell someone what time do you eat? A lot of times we associate breakfast has to be between six and eight, lunch has to be between noon and two, and then dinner is typically six and eight. So when we talk about meal timing, it really isn't about what the clock is telling us because the clock can't tell us when we're hungry or full. Um, it's basically being more aware of what your body is actually telling you and being more aware of those energy levels that might be dipping or some of the other signs we might see. Right. And do you, would you also say sort of checking in with yourself every sure. few hours and kind of assessing your hunger at that point and seeing if you might need something? Yeah. And yeah. do you want to talk about checking in? Like, what does that look like? Yeah, checking in <clears throat> might feel like, you know, hunger feels different for everybody and in everybody's body it feels different. So if I ignore a growling stomach for a long period of time, my body might be trying to get my attention in a different way. I. I might lose focus, I might start feeling tired, um, I might get, you know, popular term now, hangry, you know, kind of cranky. You mean where nobody wants to be around you? That yeah, kind of hangry? you know, you've been around me when that's happened before. <laughs> um, but really kind of assessing, you know, what you're feeling like in your body and determining, you know, 
gosh, might I actually be hungry now? Maybe yeah. it's time to start thinking about making a plan to get to some food. Sure. The other piece, too, that a lot of people don't think about is sometimes we'll have people say, well, I'm not hungry. You know, sometimes we can let ourselves get so hungry and our blood sugar drops so low yeah. that we actually stop being hungry. And if anything, we feel nauseous and right. we feel ill and then it's really right. hard to eat. So those are also things when we say checking in, yeah. you know, that's, again, a sign that we might actually want to want to think about. Yep. Certainly. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Okay, so we want to talk a little bit now, I think, about what may be, um, what are not the benefits of skipping meals. So I think a common myth is that I'm saving my calories. And right. although our conversation isn't specific to weight management, so much of this country is always worried about their weight or trying to lose weight. So, yeah. um, you know, I think we want to be clear that although from a, a numerical standpoint, are you saving calories? Well, if I have roughly 2,000 calories to work with and I'm not eating breakfast, I could say, well, yeah, I'm saving 600 calories. But as you know, right. uh, we don't really save them because the reality is we end up getting so hungry later right. in the day that we end up really making up those calories. Right, and I know but when I work with people, the, the more I tell them to eat more during the day, they look at me like, well, that's counterintuitive. Why would I do that? I'm, you know, uh, um, why would you be telling me to eat more? But in, in reality, as you say, you know, you, it's the net gain is that you're actually not eating as much later in the day. Oh, yeah. And oftentimes you're thinking, well, maybe they didn't hear what I said. I came in and said I wanted to lose weight yeah. and you're telling me to eat more food. Right. Well, really, you're going to end up eating less because you're not letting yourself get so hungry that we're more likely to overeat. Right. So, yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. And then when we think about eating during the day, you know, food is fuel. And for most people, we're most active during the day. And that's when our body is requiring the most amount of energy or calories coming in. Um, and if we're not fueling up regularly throughout the day, we're always, you know, our brain is smart. We're set up for survival. We're gonna be thinking about food all the time. And then when we have access to food, we're likely to overeat. Right. So. And and I mean, talk about having lots of things on our minds. The last thing we probably want to have on our mind is thinking about food all day long. All day long. So yeah, one, day, one way to certainly alleviate that <laughs> yeah. is eat a little bit more often. Yeah, That's and we'll right. talk a little bit more afterwards about what we're talking about when we say eat more often. Right. Obviously, this is not a free-for-all and we yes. can just eat all the time, but right. certainly- Strategically. The yes, Strategically. I think that would be a great yeah. term. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And again, the other piece I think that we need to remember is the hungrier we get, we're not looking for a salad when we're really hungry, right. you know, or we're not looking for those vegetables that we need more of. Right. When you get really hungry, it's just natural that your body is going to crave a lot of calories. And so we're going to right. go for the higher fat foods, the higher sugary right. foods that are going mm -hmm. to bring our blood sugar up really quickly. And that's something else to remember. Yeah about eating more often is that when we are keeping our blood sugars at more normal levels, we're less inclined to be influenced by those type of, of cravings. That's right, yeah. that's right, right, because our brain is set up for survival, right? Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't care why we're not eating, yeah. right? If we're busy or if an asteroid hit the planet and there's no <laughs> food, or right. you know, if you're, if you're trying to lose weight and restrict what you're eating or you just go long periods of time without eating, your, your brain is set up to help you go forage for food and find food, so you'll be thinking about food all the time. You got it. Right. And as much as we all love to eat, I don't think we want to be thinking about food all the time. All the time. So that would be nice right. to have some spaces in between <laughs> where we space. can do some other things. That's right. Right. Um, the other piece about, I think, meal timing, so we've sort of talked about it's not about the clock, right. but we're also talking about how much time do we spend, spend eating, eating yeah. our meal. You mm -hmm. know, again, when you hear terms like mindless eating and mindful eating, right. um, certainly I think we've all practiced mindless eating. Yes. We eat very quickly. We don't pay attention to our food. We really don't even register that we've had a meal because we're so distracted. So mm -hmm. I think part of this, too, is the importance of spending time with your food, right. using your senses, making the meal last yeah. so that you can really appreciate it. Yeah, I love the concept of spending time with your food and really engaging all your senses so yeah. that, you know, your brain is emotionally satisfied as well as your stomach. Yeah. And we know, right, science tells yeah. us 
that it takes about 20 minutes, and I think the new research is showing for some people even up to 30 minutes for your brain to recognize the fact that there's food in your stomach and you can st stop feeling hungry. Absolutely. Right? And of course that's because that's how long it starts to take, uh, it, it takes you to start digesting and for your blood sugar levels to rise and the stretch receptors on your stomach to send the signal up to your brain. There's food here, you can stop being hungry. But that takes a bit of time. Yeah. And it's easy to miss that signal. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. I think it would be very fair to say that if you asked probably the average person, maybe not the dinner meal, but certainly the lunch meal, yeah. how much time they spend, you know, eating lunch. And I can speak yeah. for our students because yes. we work with students. You know, I think if they get 10 minutes, that's a long meal. Yeah. It's five or 10 minutes. And I think we all know we can eat a lot of food in 20 minutes. Yeah. So yeah. if you're really hungry, you know, and, and again, just eating, we can get a lot of calories that way before we realize how full we really are. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Definitely agree yeah. with that. Uh, mm -hmm. The other piece that I can certainly speak to medically, what are the benefits of eating more slowly is we yeah. chew our food more thoroughly. Mm -hmm. And so by chewing our food better, we've mm -hmm. already basically helped our digestion because then our stomach doesn't have to work right. quite as hard. And so we've begun that process. And the other piece, of course, is reflux and heartburn. Yep. So that if you are struggling with reflux or heartburn by eating smaller meals, taking more time to eat those meals, you're less likely to have those things happen. Right, so all our concepts come together there, spacing the meals, eating more slowly, it's all it, a good thing. It's, uh, it's amazing, and you know, to, to bring it even home to that, the other thing that you mentioned earlier is that the longer we take to eat, the more aware we become of how full we are. Right. And then we can comfortably end a meal rather than find out we overate and then be really uncomfortable. And I know you've worked with clients as well as I have who, when they start slowing down and really paying attention to what they're eating, they are simply amazed that they can leave food on their plate because they can actually tune into the fact that they've had enough to eat oh. and they can walk away. And so that, and, and people are just amazed that that happens. They don't have to be a member of the Clean Plate Club anymore. <laughs> yes, and what a relief, right? Because yeah. sometimes the challenge is, how do I not be a member of this Clean Plate Club? That's so right. absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then we talk about energy levels. So how often has it happened that you eat a very large meal? And we talked about when you're hungry, mm -hmm. you go for the sugar and the fat. Yeah. Well, we have no energy after a large meal. We right. typically fall asleep, and those are the moments you have a hard time keeping your eyes open right. You know, about an hour later. So we'll look at balance of that meal, but also the quantity. If you're eating a right. large meal, you're going to be more tired, so you're really not going to have the energy later in the day. Right. It's almost, it's almost the opposite of what you're trying to achieve. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Our bodies are amazing that way. Yeah. They are telling us things. We just don't listen. Yeah. <laughs> we need to tune our ears inward, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so let's talk a little bit about maybe breakfast specifically. Yeah. Do you mm -hmm. want to talk about? I know that's always controversial. People so certainly say, do I need to eat breakfast? Do I not eat breakfast? Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. I, you know, I have always had great luck, and I think the research is starting to, um, you know, to support us with this, and it has really been, been out there for a long period of time, that you know, uh, you you wake up in a fasted state, right? right? So in order to get your day started um, and really get your energy levels up, and I know you work with athletes mm -hmm. a lot, and um, we even tell athletes now, you know, to fuel forward, right? Sure. You're getting into the most active part of your day. You need some energy on board. I, I always think it's it's like asking your car to run an empty yeah. tank of gas if you start the day off without breakfast. Oh. And, and like we said before, breakfast could be anything. It doesn't have to be, you know, French toast and eggs and bacon. It can be anything. You can get creative and it doesn't even have to be a breakfast food, right? It can Absolutely. be something else. Oh, it can be the Chinese leftovers. It really depends. Right? And the other key to that is I'm sitting here listening to you talk. You know, I think about the student that's going to bed at two or three in the morning and they're like, Franca, do you really think I'm going to get up at seven or eight to eat breakfast? No, remember, yeah. it's not about the clock. Right. Breakfast implies we're breaking the fast of sleep. Right. You know, so we've slept all night and we haven't eaten. So for some people, breakfast really might be 10 o'clock. Right. It might be 11 o'clock, and then you're going to eat lunch maybe later in the middle of the afternoon. Right. So this doesn't mean that you have to get up early right. just to have breakfast. Exactly. Yeah. We could even just call it 
first meal of the day. Yeah, it doesn't right? sound it doesn't, quite as catchy. It doesn't, it doesn't, <laughs> but you know, whatever works. <laughs> Absolutely. And again, you know, a lot of the studies that we do see are maybe academically focused because we're looking at school age populations in terms of how right. breakfast benefits them. But even if it's not about academics, we know that sustained energy levels that we have during the morning, that sometimes it takes us a longer while to get going. Sure, coffee is great, but we can't rely just on caffeine right. to get us going. So regardless of whether or not it makes us smarter, which is great in the classroom, but for all of us, I think certainly there's a benefit there. Right, right, even just in terms of feeling good and yeah. energized, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Who doesn't want that? Yeah, well, I do. Um, yeah. <laughs> and again, I think the key thing is when we start the day out that way and looking at, you know, typically, which we're going to talk about now is not just eating breakfast, but then what are you having at breakfast? Right. And the comment that I hear not infrequently is when I eat breakfast, I'm hungrier than when I don't. And sure, so I don't want to eat breakfast <laughs> because I don't want to be hungry all the time. Right. You know, so right. there we might talk about what are you choosing to eat? Right. Right. Yeah. And, and we know a good balance of foods yep. are, are really important. And I think what what we do know from research and anecdotal information um, is that when we add a good source of protein and maybe some foods that are higher in fiber, we can really stabilize the blood sugar levels and slow down the emptying time of your stomach. So not only are we energized, but we're energized for longer periods of time. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and again, we're not adverse to any one food. Certainly, we, we really are. Right. We believe all foods do fit. But on the other hand, if you're starting the day out with two Pop-Tarts, because two always come in one sleeve, and who doesn't eat both? Got to eat both. Got to eat both, because what are you going to do with that other Pop-Tart, no, no, right? No, it, nothing. <laughs> right. But basically, and it's going to get stale, so we don't want to yeah, throw it out. But basically, that. that's all sugar, and that's the type of meal that's going to make you hungry fast. That's right. It'll last for about an hour, hour and a half, and then you notice you're hungry again, and then, right. oh my God, I'm going to eat again. So as you said, the, got, the idea is make sure you've got a great source of protein there to yeah. balance out that sugar, and ideally not relying on that much sugar, obviously, for breakfast. Right. But having protein with that meal would certainly help. Right. So what would you think a good sort of first meal would be that would look balanced? Um, certainly, I think of eggs. If people like eggs, that's a whole other discussion that we probably don't mm -hmm. have time for today in right. terms of how many eggs should I eat. Right. Uh, but eggs are a good, complete source of protein that we can always use. You could right. use some cheese, sparingly, and omelet if you were going to make with the eggs. We could use peanut butter. Uh -huh. uh, we can certainly use tofu. We can be very creative in the morning right. and do a tofu scramble if you're not wishing to do eggs. Right. Um, yeah, but certainly things like that that we can we can use that mm -hmm. sometimes we don't think about. And I think oftentimes the almond butter, the peanut butter is one that mm -hmm. we might shy away from a little bit because it's butter or we think it's really high in fat. Right. And although it has fat, it's also a good source of protein and it's actually a healthy type of fat. Right. And fat also helps keep us fuller longer, right? It does. And what really most people don't realize is our brains really do like fat. Yeah. And when we don't get a lot of fat in our diets, sometimes we're thinking about food a lot. And it's yeah. not that we haven't eaten enough, but it may be yeah. that we're really not getting the nutrients that we need. Yeah. yeah. I like that. Now, briefly on that note, because we're really sort of been focusing on meal timing, in meal timing, we also talk about snacks. So right. maybe we want to elaborate a little bit on what do we mean by snacks. Yeah, I think what one of our slides talked about a little bit earlier is sort of thinking about, and it's not a hard and fast rule, but we tend to get hungry and need to eat about every three to five hours during the day. Would you yeah. Would you agree? And it's yeah. you know it, it, there's some wiggle room there, you know, based on individuality and what you've eaten. Um, but for most people, there is a gap of time, I would say, um, between some meals that's longer than that three to five hour period, right? right. So where the blood sugar levels are really going to start to dip. And we need to kind of just insert something there to get us from meal A to meal B or meal B to meal C. And, um, you know, we always talk about maybe thinking beyond what we would think of as a typical snack, which might be chips or cookies or a muffin or something like that. And really, I know we've called it before mini meals mm -hmm. or, sure. you know, sort of a balanced snack, right, yeah. would you say? 
-hmm. And again, I think the same principle applies that we talked about at breakfast, yeah. that with your snacks too, make sure you have a good source of protein because if we haven't said it before, protein will keep you full longer. Yes. Now, if you only do protein, you're not going to get the benefits of the carbohydrate piece of the snack, right. which is going to bring your blood sugar up fairly quickly, which is good because then we're not as hungry. Right. So you really do want that combination of both. And I think we want to be clear that people often confuse snacking because there's a lot of information out there and depending on what regimen people are following, snacks are bad. Yeah. You know, we're not saying random eating. We're really mm -hmm. saying you've made an effort to think about what you want to eat, what combination of foods you're going to have. So for example, I'm going to bring a half a cup of trail mix with me, or maybe I'll have an ounce or two of almonds and I'll have a fruit with that. Right. But it's not that I'm bringing the whole bag of almonds and it's right. sitting next to me on, at my desk and I'm going to snack on that for the next couple of hours. So right. I think really an important distinction between snacking and grazing. Right. You know, grazing is sort of more that random eating through the kitchen sort yeah. of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I like to think of those types of snacks as really being strategic and useful yep. and having a beginning and an end to them, right? Yep. So not the bottomless bag of something, but, you know, a piece of fruit and a cheese stick that has a beginning and an end to it. Oh, um, absolutely. And then you just move on. Yeah, and the funny thing is, again, sometimes when we show our, our clients basically what a snack looks like, yeah. they look at it and they're like, are you kidding me? That's going to keep me full. Yeah. It's amazing. It's you amazing. don't need a lot. If yeah. you're really listening to what your body's saying and you're noticing you're getting a little bit hungry, it yeah. really doesn't take very much to get rid of that hunger and allow right. you to focus and then get to that next meal. Right. And of course, if you if you really are tuning into that hunger and you need a little bit more, then you certainly can have a little bit more. Yeah. yeah. And then taking that to the next step and then people say, well, if I have a really large snack, then what does that mean about lunch? Well, then if we're listening to what our body's saying, the idea would be we wouldn't eat as much at lunch. Right. You know, we Look would eat that. less. Maybe we'll have a leftover snack for later in the afternoon. Yeah. But that the idea is not that we have to eat everything at lunch, but if we're fuller from right. the snack, we're actually going to eat a little bit less at lunch. Time. Yeah, and I think that brings us full circle to really kind of tuning into the messages and all that wisdom that our body has. Um, if we can, you know, sort of tune our ears inward um, and just get that information. Yeah, and I think a key piece to this is that for some people, clearly, this can be challenging and it can even be frustrating because yeah. we're asking people to take time to listen yeah. and we respect that people days are, people's days are really busy and they're packed. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh my God, I don't know if I have the time to do that. But if we begin to practice these things very yeah. slowly, they really do become very intuitive. Yeah, they do. And we should just let people know that this type of eating does take practice, just yeah. as you said, and it takes some time. I know, you know, we all want everything to have happened yesterday, right. um, but this, and, and it's really worthwhile because it's really life changing when it, when, oh when people do it and really get the knack of it, wouldn't you say? Oh my gosh, the freedom yeah. of just not being controlled, your life is not being controlled by eating all the time and thinking about food all the time, yeah. it is really life changing. Yeah. But again, we have to be patient, it takes patient. time. Right. And just like with anything, you have to practice and start very small. You know, right. start one increment, one meal at a time, one snack at a time, right. we're not asking you to certainly change this overnight. Right. And celebrate those successes, right? Oh, absolutely, <laughs> I was gonna say, and that's gonna be a great wrap up yeah, because yay. things that you really do wanna remember again is you know whenever you're eating whether it's a snack or a meal try to combine that with the protein and carbohydrate yeah. and I know we've offered some suggestions certainly on the slides right um, and then we're gonna let you know in a minute in terms of other resources that you might be able to use right. um, and the important thing is again is recognizing that when we say um, being mindful to hunger again we're not saying when we say about every three to four hours that you have to eat right. every three to four hours. We're saying three to four hours, you might want to check in yes. to see where you feel your hunger might be so that we That's can get right. it early rather than late. That's right, I agree. And also when we talked about timing, we also sort of extrapolated that to the time that you spend with your food, yes. right? And eating slowly and checking in with yourself even as you're eating. Do I need to finish that whole plate if I know I'm gonna eat again in three to four hours maybe. Um, you know, predictability lends itself to eating less in the long run, I think. Oh, 
Oh, and the other piece is you might be surprised that if you're spending more time with your food, that sometimes what you're eating isn't that good. Yeah. And then you have to make a decision, oh, yeah. do I eat this or do I eat something else? Mm -hmm. But when we're eating really fast, sometimes we don't even realize that what we had was yeah. not very satisfying or we didn't really like it. So certainly that's, that's, right. that's a plus. Yeah. So we want you to know there's lots of resources out there for any of you that might be interested in pursuing this conversation or certainly wishing to begin this journey of, of, of using meal timing as a way to make some changes. And so for those of you that are staff, faculty, or employees, I know that Live for Life offers uh, support services for anybody that wishes to meet with a dietitian. And if anyone is a student at Duke, whether graduate, undergraduate, medical students, any of the health sciences, certainly Tony and I are happy to meet with any of those students and feel free to call Student Health or then you can email us directly and we would be happy um, to meet with you. Thanks so much. Thanks Bye. for spending.